I'm going to go ahead and start because I'm trying to stay on time. Uh, how were your concurrent sessions? Yeah, a few of them ran over. I take that as a good sign. I heard some conversation, a little bit of laughter, a lot of people in some of those rooms. Um, we, we didn't want to close the formal part of this conference um, without getting in the weeds and being really practical. Um, so I took um, as the you know, sort of animating idea behind my talk the notion that um, we have a responsibility to bend the arc of health care toward justice, to take a little liberty with Martin Luther King's phrase. Now, some of you who signed up for this conference very early know that Jim Conway was going to give this closing lecture. He's a terrific guy. He was my colleague for many years at Boston Children's Hospital, where he was the eventually the assistant hospital director. Then he went to the Dana-Farber as the executive vice president and chief operating officer. And then he went to the Institute for Health Improvement as a senior vice president um, before he eventually went as an adjunct professor in organizational ethics to the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, he would have been perfect. I will not be perfect. <laughs> When I talked to him about this talk, I said, Jim, I really need a cleanup batter. Uh, you know, someone who is a power hitter, you know, kind of fourth in the lineup, whose job is to clean up everybody on the bases, bring in all those walks and talks and base hits um, that we've been putting on the bases all day. Besides, Jim is Irish. Nobody can tell a funny story or a joke as well as Jim Conway, especially not me. Um, but Jim is sick, I'm very sorry to say. He hated to miss the opportunity to talk to all of you, and he feels badly about not being here. So you're sort of stuck with me. I'm the pitch pinch hitter. I've just exhausted my entire knowledge of baseball. <laughs> um, but I do have a lot of experience with ethics committees and uh, organizational ethics. So um, what I want to do is just uh, get practical, if I can make this work. OK, so my objectives are to identify the procedures and talk about those in some detail about um, an approach to doing organizational ethics, at least as one of our hospitals developed it, the one that Bob Trug and Jeff Burns and Mike Epstein and I over the years um, developed. And I want you to learn from our mistakes, so I'm going to talk about some of those consults because I think we learn um, best sometimes from the things that don't go quite the way we thought they were going to. So. Um, in the beginning, so I'm talking about the 1980s, we did the same thing that everybody else did. We did those policies that um, had to do with decisions not to resuscitate. We didn't get it right the first time. We've since revised it. We're still talking about the revision we just did. But anyway, we did that kind of ordinary policy work, um, including addressing cases and issues of intractable conflict and possibly medically inappropriate care or medically futile disagreement, disagreements about medical futility and so forth. Um, so we did those kinds of policy development and review that we all understand to be a core part of the um, things that clinical ethics committees in hospitals do. Um, I want to tell you about a time when I was up on what we used to call the multidisciplinary intensive care unit for rounds, just kind of hanging around and see what was going on. And um, one of the intensivists said to me that he had talked with a family whose child had died in the ICU. And um, he had been involved in uh, looking at the autopsy, the resident had gotten the consent, the autopsy had been done, um, 
patient had gone to the pathology lab, and after the results were back, um, this intensivist met with the parents to talk about, this is what usually happens, the results from the autopsy. And as they were asking questions, they realized that their daughter had been buried while our hospital still had her organs. And they were pretty surprised. So the intensivist asked whether we ever do ethics consults about things like that. That's not at all like the kind of individual case consults that we usually do. Uh, I, I said, you know, we haven't, and doesn't mean we won't, and we'll talk about it. And um, a number of us talked about how to get involved in this and whether or not this was something that was appropriate for our hospital's ethics committee to get involved in. In fact, you know, as, as we discussed it with people, some people said, why do we even worry about autopsies anymore? We can look inside bodies before people die, and uh, maybe this is not really an important issue. Now, remember, or maybe you don't know, that Boston Children's Hospital is the place where Stella and Richard von Prague were, Stella uh, von Prague was a cardiologist and um, cardiac pathologist, and she and her husband together um, developed the system in pediatrics for categorizing congenital cardiac anomalies. And uh, Richard Van Prague's office, which I've been in, has jars, not anymore, of hearts in them that were used for teaching purposes to show, for example, tetralogy of flow and its various permutations. So, you know, we really cared about getting medical autopsies done and doing them right. Um, that said, there were um, a lot of us who didn't know very much about autopsies and didn't know um, how much other people knew about it. And so Bob Trug and Jeff Burns and others um, and I uh, decided that we needed more information and we had a really good uh, fellow, Glenn Rosenbaum, who um, actually did a national survey looking at all pediatric and adult hospitals that had uh, critical care fellowships and asking chief residents as sort of the stand-in for residents generally about what the autopsy practices and the autopsy consent form looked like, and also checking their knowledge about autopsies. One of the shocking things about this, and this is a detour, and I'll try not to be very long on it, is how little they knew about what a complete autopsy really was. Now, these are the people who, in the middle of the night, are the ones who are getting consent from families. So if they don't know that it's pretty routine for the internal organs to be retained, then how are the families going to know? And if it isn't mentioned or it isn't said clearly in the consent form, how are families going to know? So um, among the things we found from that study was that 72% of the autopsy consent forms had no mention of what would happen to the organs. And 97% um, of the places that were surveyed, and this had a very high response rate, had no educational materials for the family. Now, there was a fair amount of opposition to doing this look at autopsy consent practices at our hospital, um, especially from, but not exclusively from, the chief of pathology, who really sort of felt that we ought to be minding our own business, and he hadn't asked for our help, and why were we doing this? Um, he didn't think the ethics committee ought to be involved at all, and he said so. I didn't ask for your input. Um, not to say that there wasn't some support. Um, our associate general counsel, for example, um, thought that it was a good thing to do. Now, you know, there's another possibility that, you know, we might be sued over something like this. And if we actually took seriously a concern that the families had, and really changed our practices and made them better to address the concerns that, had, that they raised because of what had happened to them. You know, it's sort of doing the right thing if for, for maybe not even for the best reason, maybe not for a wrong reason. At any rate, um, mostly the question to us was, what gives you 
the right to go looking over our shoulders, getting, you know, meddling in our business. Um, now, not being someone who's easily stopped, we didn't exactly quit. Um, and we did end up making some recommendations for changes in the autopsy consent form. We spent hours and hours of ethics committee meetings talking about whether we should have a checklist and let families have a buffet. And we talked about differences between complete and partial autopsies and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, at any rate, we also um, looked at the education for residents and attendings about what an autopsy actually involves and um, the kind of educational program for the multidisciplinary team around things to do at the end of life, particularly when a child um, dies. So when I was preparing this talk, I went looking for our revised autopsy consent form. And I don't want to seem narcissistic, but when I Googled Boston Children's Hospital autopsy consent, that picture came <laughs> <laughs> And I thought to myself, God, that's how I felt. You know, it, it seemed like this never was going to end. And nobody liked the fact that we had their nose in their business. Um, we did end up five, five years later with a different autopsy, a, a different chief of pathology, but I had nothing to do with that. Um, <laughs> a new consent form that lists rights, explains what an autopsy is, um, offers some options for what happens to organs, and, and also included permission for research if um, tissues were retained and uh, information about other limitations. Now, this is not about autopsy consent. This is about organizational ethics consults. And one of the things we learned from this is you know, it's a little hard to go mucking around in an institution around broad system issues and policy concerns without some sort of authorization for at least looking at it. And so we had to resolve this problem about, um, at least in this case, that we had not had formal institutional authorization. So we sat down with our um, chief administrative team and uh, Bob and I, I'm not sure, I, I didn't tell him that I was going to say this, but I'll take responsibility if he doesn't want to, um, outlined a process for going about doing um, organizational ethics consults. And um, I, I outline this list of things to do, and this talk will be in a PDF on our website if you want to go back and get it later. Um, because uh, it sets out a process that we developed whereby we actually work with the CEO or whoever the administrator is around the issue that um, has been coming to us and we think raises some pretty important ethical issues and figure out whether or not there's enough of a problem there that they and we both think that we ought to devote some attention to it. And then what we do is move forward by proposing some way of doing that. And as James mentioned earlier today in the panel discussion, our standing clinical ethics committees, or sometimes our IRBs, research ethics committees, don't always have the requisite expertise in those groups already. And so sometimes it's best to put together a task force or a study team or a working group um, specifically around a particular issue um, when there's administrative authorization, draft a charge about what they're actually supposed to be doing. And I can't tell you how many times you go back and look to see what that charge says you said you were going to do, um, and a timeline with internal uh, interim deadlines and a date for getting a report done. Now, partly that's in there because administrators think when they've told you to do something, it should land on their desk before the end of the week. And if it's not, you know, you can't do it that fast before the end of the month. And I don't think we've ever done one that got done in a week. And, um, there might be one that got done in a month, but I can't think of which one it was. And so we also said that the idea would be to pair up 
the people who lead this group, in addition to putting on members who are the key stakeholders around the various aspects of the problem, so that they would be led by someone from the Office of Ethics or from the hospital's ethics uh, infrastructure, the Eth Clinical Ethics Committee or the IRB, um, along with someone else who is also an expert in the issue that you're dealing with. So notice, we have just in coming up with this process um, taken a step toward conceding that the things that we hear about that are issues in our hospital as the variety of people on the ethics committee are uh, working on the front lines don't all, aren't always exactly the same things that the administrators think ought to be attended to. And we have essentially said, not exactly, that we wouldn't take them up unless we had um, permission from the CEO or the relevant administrator. So um, once we got this process worked out, we, I, I think the, the fact of doing it sort of got some buy-in right away. And so the next thing we knew, our CEO um, wanted us to use it. And we've had a couple of um, parents whose children needed surgery. Um, they were Jehovah's Witnesses. They wanted their children to have the surgery, but they also did not want their children to have blood during it. And um, we knew that there was a process within the hospital of um, finding surgeons and anesthesiologists and a team that was willing to be in the operating room under those circumstances. We also knew, as we talked to these people, that were they to get into trouble around blood loss um, to a person, they were um, planning that they would intervene and give blood if they had to, rather than let the child die in the OR, although the understanding in going to the OR was that the parents had agreed to the surgery but not agreed to the blood. Um, and we also had a patient coming up who had a very significant spinal deformity that needed a long, complicated surgery that might well involve some um, blood products. And so um, the way we handled that um, ethics consult was to put together a team that was co-led by uh, Judy Johnson and one of our senior uh, surgeons, John Emmons. And um, of course, we had buy-in from the CEO who wanted this to be done. Um, and we identified a working group with co-chairs and members and a timeline. And we did a report with recommendations. And just to cut to the chase, we basically said that rather than singling out patients whose um, parents were Jehovah's Witnesses, really what we ought to do is change our practices in the operating room to minimize blood loss for all our surgeries and have these um, various alternatives to blood transfusion available for all patients, including pa patients whose parents were Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, it was, uh, in my opinion, an excellent report. And uh, it went on a shelf. And it's still on the shelf. Now, partly that was our problem because we didn't get into the finances. We didn't talk to people about what it would cost, although we had done some exploration of um, and provided some information about uh, alternatives for things that could uh, meet this recommendation. Um, so the lesson learned for, for us was that we really have to anticipate in advance um, who's going to get this report and have responsibility for responding to the recommendations that are made. And uh, even though our co-chairs went to the medical staff executive committee, described the process and the recommendations and so forth, and we tried to follow up um, later by talking to various people in the OR, um, in fact, uh, I hope People don't feel terrible about having invested so much work in something that didn't happen. We did learn a lot, but in fact, we didn't change practice. Now, should you get discouraged, let me just say we had lots of positive 
um, effective organizational ethics consults that did have good outcomes. One of them had to do with um, cases that were coming to our ethics committee um, around issues regarding staff and families' involvement in uh, social media. At the time, we had like 20 different words for describing what was happening on the internet and what the problem was. And so we used this same process. There was definitely institutional authorization. In fact, there were a number of managers who wanted to take the policy approach of just say no. And there were a lot of staff who wanted the um, opportunity to cite a policy when talking to families that the hospital forbid them to do uh, to be Facebook friends or whatever it, it is. We had a um, nurse who was uh, on the care pages of a family who was reporting about uh, their son uh, and his illness at our hospital, who learned through care pages, not through taking care of the patient, that um, one of the family members was suicidal. And um, so when you're a uh, you're not exactly a lurker, but when you're on these social media and you find something that's clinically relevant, what are you supposed to do about it? We also had a patient whose child received a, a donated organ who did an internet search and found out by looking through the news and the obituaries and so forth who the likely um, donor had been and contacted that person and then got nervous after the plan to meet the mother of the donor, dead donor, in our um, hospital lobby and told the clinical team that she was worried but this was going to happen like in 15 minutes. So there were all these issues around how you learn this information and what staff are doing in uh, participating in social media. And so there was this tug about whether to just say no or to actually have a professionalism conversation about uh, how, helping people develop the judgment regarding their responsibilities in, and boundaries in interacting with patients and their families in this way. So among other things, we had a student who was taking an ethics course and an, in an MPH program from Tufts, who worked with us to do focus group interviews, both with families and with staff. And that formed a piece of the data that we included in our report, recommending that we actually have an educational program, which we do now have, um, around um, social media. It's in the mandatory yearly reviews the sort of thing that gives everybody a groan when they come up to get done. Um, but we also had an educational program that was um, carried out through ethics rounds on the clinical units to give people cases for discussing, you know, what would you do, what should you do, why wouldn't you do that um, with their peers so that um, they had some sort of anticipatory um, ideas about how to handle requests to be a Facebook friend from a mother of their patient, for example. Um, and there are some definite things you shouldn't do, like post pictures of your patients on your Facebook page. And so we wanted to get some of that message out, too. Um, so that was just to say they're not all uh, unsuccessful, but I'm going to go back to learning from our mistakes, because um, I think that's most useful. So we, you know, we had had a couple of inquiries and uh, conversations with people who were involved in continuing to care for children who had early uh, infant and toddler surgeries around um, uh, genital reconstruction for what used to be called intersex conditions as a general category. And um, there were still a number of parents whose children were in school age or adolescence, even a couple of young adults, who had not disclosed some of this information to their children. And as you might guess, as we were getting more and more knowledge about what's possible through genetics, 
everyone was worried, uh, the staff in particular, about these uh, growing children being a buccal smear away from learning genetic information that they wouldn't have any reason to know if they hadn't been told um, decisions that had been made early in their childhood. And so, and our CEO, ta-da, is a urologist. So we thought, he knows this problem in spades. Isn't this just exactly the right kind of organizational ethics issue to um, suggest we try and tackle? And so we put some stuff together, and Jeff and I sat down with him, and <laughs> he looked at us with something close to this. And, um, you know, I, I was not prepared. I mean, I just didn't even think about the possibility that he might not think this is a great idea. Um, that said, you might remember that the Intersex Society of America and people who feel very passionately about this issue were um, picketing outside hospitals. And, you know, after I got my balance back and thought about this for a while, um, in spite of the fact that we'd already done an educational retreat all day on it and invited some staff and our whole ethics committee to talk about it, um, I realized, geez, he doesn't want them outside Boston Children's Hospital picketing. And if we open up this box, you know, where is this information going to go and who's going to hear about it? And, you know, I would have liked to have done this consult, but we didn't do it. And, you know, in fact, what we did do is um, find other ways to talk about some of these issues at the time. Well, still, I mean, David Diamond is a former fellow from our bioethics program. He was um, the person that we were recommending co-chair this task force. Um, he has since developed the gender management service at Children's Hospital for children with disorders of sexual development and works with Norm Spack, who's now retired. But um, there have been other opportunities to find other ways to tackle some of this, but it wasn't done through um, the kind of process that I'm suggesting. So lastly, I want to give you an example about um, pediatric organ donation using cardiac death criteria. Um, as you all know, uh, most deaths in intensive care units today are deaths by decision to withdraw life support. And um, if you're working on a clinical ethics committee, you're probably involved in a fair percentage of the hard cases that come up around withdrawing life su support, although that's now, I think, getting routine enough for not um, having to go to ethics committees for discussion. Um, but this does mean, for a while, that um, there have been fewer organs available for transplantation because patients weren't progressing to brain death, and um, that was one of the ways that um, organs were procured. And so in the 90s, teams began to talk about using so-called non-heart-beating donors. And um, we got a call for an actual uh, individual case consult somewhere near the middle of the night about a patient in the operating room and a question from one of the surgeons about how long we actually should be waiting before declaring death and making that first incision to procure organs. And actually, all over the country, that was a huge, and in some cases still is, debate. You know, is 60 seconds too short? I think most everybody thinks so now. Is 90 seconds? Is it two minutes? Is it five minutes? Is it 10 minutes? Um, and especially in pediatrics, where um, the capacity to resuscitate uh, young children, even after a fairly extended period of time, is um, it's pretty remarkable. So uh, as a result of that middle of the night uh, discussion among the uh, surgeons and the critical care folks and uh, some of us from the ethics committee, the hospital decided to put together a task force uh, on pediatric organ donation using cardiac death criteria that Charlotte Harrison, I don't know if she's still here, um, was involved in along with Bob and a number of other people in our hospital and they made recommendations. Now the reason I picked this one to give as an example is because um, one of the things that this task force did 
is decide that there were issues that we really needed some community input about. And uh, so uh, the Harvard Teaching Hospitals have a, something called a community ethics committee. Some of you went to the session that Carol Powers and Enos Gardner and Jolene McGreevy did around their most recent report um, regarding unknown and unrepresented patients. And so this was the first case that came to that committee. And um, Charlotte provided a very detailed uh, memo that was drawn up by the task force to the Community Ethics Committee with some very specific questions that we um, wanted their input about. And um, just to tell you about one of them, uh, the, this, this discussion in the uh, pediatric organ donation using cardiac death criteria task force was very contentious. This is about, you know, do children die still in the intensive care unit with their families there and then get raced through the corridors to the operating room to procure the organs? Or do we set up the operating room so families can be there and we watch them as we withdraw life support and see when they die? And then we do the incision to re retrieve the organs. So there were a number of people on the task force who went into the conversation and never changed their minds about this just being a terrible idea. And there were other people who went into the discussion feeling like, yeah, we need to find out a way to do this and do it right. And um, so among the things we entertained was the possibility that we would not tell families that there was this other way of donating their child's organs unless they asked us. And if they asked us, then, of course, we would tell them all about it. And so we explained to the um, Community Ethics Committee that this was what the task force was considering. And the Community Ethics Committee sort of looked back at us and said, what? Um, and it may be the only thing in all the reports they've been so emphatic about. They said, um, this quote, this approach was unanimously thoroughly and resoundingly rejected by the Community Ethics Committee. That's about as emphatic language as I've ever seen in their reports. Um, so, and they also talked about the organ donation language using this presumed, uh, presumptive consent process, um, which they thought was creepy. Um, so anyway, this was an example of um, getting at least some pretty informed and thoughtful uh, input from people who are not on the inside about something that could affect any parent whose child very unexpectedly and tragically ends up in an intensive care unit and is going to die and who might want to think about donating organs. Um, so, and one of the lessons learned from this was when you pick members, um, don't pick people who are so dug in. This is a task force ahead of minority report in our hospital. Um, so, um, just to say that there are a whole bunch of kinds of ethical issues that can be handled by the kind of method that I'm describing. I'm not going to talk about these in any detail, but they'll be on the PDF on the website. And to review what the pitfalls are, um, you know, you have to deal with giving advice that is or isn't institutionally authorized. Um, you have to arrange in advance for follow-up on the recommendations that these um, kinds of task forces make. Um, getting to know is a little hard to hear because you've gone to a CEO and you find out that what you thought really needed to be handled they don't want to hear about and figuring out what to do with that. Um, your advice is probably as good as mine. And then figuring out uh, how to construct a task force that's actually effective in getting their work done without being deadlocked in disagreements is important. Um, so I've only talked about ethics committees as a multidisciplinary group, in most cases here, specially formulated for dealing with some of these kinds of inside institutional issues, which is not all there is to organizational ethics. Um, but it is, I think, one way of getting into the weeds and getting very practical about how you could actually 
when you identify an ethical issue in your institution that you want to do something about in a broader way, use this kind of process. So in closing, I am convinced that there's a role for ethics committees in addressing organizational issues, not just ethics committees looking at individual case consults. After 30 years of working with ethics committees, not just my own at Boston Children's Hospital, but also reviewing ethics programs around the United States and a couple in European countries. In fact, I'm going to an ethics committee in Maine next week to talk with them. It's clearer and clearer to me that healthcare ethics committees are an underutilized resource in our hospitals and healthcare institutions. Now, I suspect if you're working on an ethics committee, you might not feel that way. Because for one thing, you don't get a separate salary for doing it. And for another thing, uh, you know, it's kind of a mixed blessing when you get a request for an ethics consult. But I'm talking about not just those individual consults, but the problems around them that are really bugging you and that sap morale in an institution and finding a way to try and address it. And that sometimes gives you energy you didn't know you had. In my opinion, members of ethics committees include some of the most committed, energetic, still idealistic, value-centered staff who feel called to continue working in a hospital, people who care about doing good, not just doing well, and who work long and hard to try and solve. Um, How many of you have been in ethics committees? They usually are scheduled for an hour and a half or two hours that went over time in trying to talk about a case consult. Yeah, so, you know, and that's not billable hours, right? Um, it, in my opinion, ethics committees can be relied on to think creatively and also speak candidly about ethically justifiable alternatives about what to do and what not to do. They, should, they want, as we all should want, to be proud of our hospital's work and mission in the world. They want, as we all should want, to help our hospitals fulfill their missions to heal the sick, ease the suffering, and prevent the sickness of those around us, especially the most vulnerable and least well off. It is not that ethics committees don't understand the pragmatic and financial goals of keeping a healthcare system solvent. It's not that ethics committees don't understand that phrase we've already heard today, no margin, no mission. They know it takes money, an operating margin, to provide healthcare. But ethics committees are also likely to say, no mission, no margin. When hospitals lose sight of their ethical responsibilities, especially in the domain of their clinical mission, especially when staff don't feel able to fulfill their mission to serve the sick with care and compassion, the human infrastructure starts to crumble, and the margin as well as the mission is compromised. In ethics committees, hospital administrators have already in place a group of committed staff who bring multiple perspectives and disciplines to the examination of inequities and broad social justice problems in delivering health care. I think it's time for ethics committees to partner with hospital leaders and for hospital leaders to partner with their ethics committees to identify and address bigger problems in health care. Not all of them at once, but one or two at a time that we can all agree need our attention and a compassionate values-driven, mission-driven solution to make our institutions a better place. So that's all I have to say. I'd love to have comments or questions and uh, see what you think. Bob. to 
although, as you pointed out, not always true. But I think that that same strategy also leads to one of the harshest criticisms of ethics committees overall, which is that they have been completely co-opted by the hospitals in which they work. And that um, you know, unless leadership agrees to uh, support exploring a certain issue, then it doesn't get done. And so many of the uh, more contentious issues remain unexplored. Um, you know, we had Charles Bosk here, an anthropologist, uh, last year discussing his book on this. And I mean, he was partially critical of the complete absence of uh, inability of ethics committees to be outsiders and to look critically at, what, at what's going on in hospitals. And it's particularly relevant to the topic here of social justice, because I think uh, very often hospital administrators do not want to talk about that. They see it as a threat to their sort of financial plan. Um, and so, you know, it, it seems to be kind of a, a, a mixed bag, Christine. It's not, it's not all on the positive side. And um, no. you know, I don't know what we can do about that because we do work in these hospitals. Our salaries come from them. And to, 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 to pick on topics that they don't want you to talk about um, can be very counterproductive to our existence. Yeah, and I think sometimes we actually do have to take risks. I know you know this because, you know, it, it may not save lives, but Elaine and you and I and a bunch of other people have been very involved in talking back to our hospital about the decision they made around Prouty Garden. So, you know, it's maybe not the most compelling ethical issue in the world, but I think it matters. And so there are times when you actually have to decide, is this an issue that's so important that we're gonna find a way to deal with it and if I lose my job over it, I'll have to look for another job. Now, I'm not telling you all to do this. I'm just saying it, it has occurred to me more than once. Uh, has it ever occurred to you? Yeah, it's awful that, well, I, I <laughs> <laughs> Has it ever occurred to you? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, and I had kids, and I didn't look for another job. But those are risks that are very hard to take, and you don't necessarily have to take them. There are plenty of problems, and it's not that hard to find one that could get administrative buy-in unless you have a CEO who really isn't able to step up to being the chief ethics officer. And if that's the case, then it's a really hard environment to work in. Danish. Well, it's very clear you're not going to be effective if you can't take into account the and see from the perspective of hospital administration the relevance of the financial considerations. Those just do matter. Of course they matter. Okay, tired, ready to go. So let's close. Um, I want to say a bit about the poster session. Uh, I'm not sure whether you all know uh, we, first of all, we started a master's program last fall and admitted uh, 21 students, 10 of whom will be graduating in May. Um, a part of that master's program requires a field experience. So in addition to getting an academic, a rigorous academic education, they also can't get out of our program without having some uh, 
familiarity with the work of bioethics in the real world. And so those uh, students who are graduating this year have prepared posters of their field experiences and their capstone projects. And um, you have on your name badge a number on the back that uh, corresponds to a number of one of the um, poster boards that has two posters on it. And so what we would ask you to do is go to the poster boards that you have the number for to give our students a chance to tell you um, about the work that they did, at least two of them. And then, you know, we don't think it's going to last for more than, you know, one group at each post, a set of two posters. But after that, you may want to go and look at some of the other ones um, and also go pick up something to drink and something to eat. We're going to have a nice reception. Um, I want to give a thank you to our staff. You know, we are now two years into this new Center for Bioethics. We've hired 14 adjunct and part-time faculty and six staff. Lisa Bastille, who's here, is our program and finance administrator. Lisa Mayer um, designed this great booklet. She's our communications coordinator. Um, and Blair Kahn and Paula, Paula Atkinson and Tony Tugenberg are here, along with Brooke Tempesta, who's the coordinator of the master's program. So if you had a good time today, please tell them thank you. Um, we have just started, yesterday, a uh, fundraising effort. Um, our budget didn't change between when we were a division of medical ethics and our new center for bioethics. We have hired all those staff I just told you about and quadrupled our programs. And we found money in various places. Um, and we're working with a development officer to try and actually identify some philanthropy. And we've gone after a number of grants, including the one that supported this conference. But we are also providing a card that's on the table, if you didn't get one, for individuals to let us know that you're willing to financially support the center. Now, we're not asking you to put us in your will, although if you want to do that, that's okay. Um, what matters to us is that we have your support. That could be $2 or $20 or $200 or $20,000. You can do the math. Um, I would be happy if we had, over the year, 100% support from the people who interact with our Center for Bioethics, even if every single one of them is a $2 donation. What we care about is your participation with us in the work that we're doing. So um, you can either put a check in here, or you can uh, go to our website and click on the button and use a credit card. Um, but please also know that this is something that we're going to be doing that we will want your help with as we figure out how to um, raise funds for the center. We were allowed to become a center at something around 10% of what's ordinarily required of um, a budget to start a center at Harvard Medical School. And, um, and we're trying to be very good stewards of that money, but we also, this is the thing you learn about being an administrator, like it's, money matters. And I was really into thinking about just do the right thing. Yeah, so anyway, that's it for um, <laughs> fundraising. Um, on behalf of our planning committee, our staff, Bob Trug and myself, um, we all want to thank you for coming. So go see the posters and by all means stay and have a drink with us and go back to your home institutions and take up some of these broader um, institutional problems that bend the arc of healthcare toward justice. Thank you.